Hello and welcome to this podcast series. Um, next up, we have our innovation evangelist, Neris Mutlow, talking with Tom Cheesewright, an applied futurist. Over to you guys. Hello, Neris. Hi, hey, Tom. How are you? Good, thanks. Good. So you've got innovation in your title. It seems like an appropriate subject to talk about, and, and particularly at this yeah. current period where it feels like pretty much every organisation in EMEA has had to innovate sort of driven by this shock of COVID. There's been an enormous amount of innovation in the technology we use, the way we work. And I guess my, I, I've been very impressed by that. But I guess my concern is, can we continue that momentum? Is there a possibility of maintaining that momentum of innovation? Or are we just going to sort of snap back to old ways of doing things? Yeah, I think, uh, I think there is a danger that, you know, when this is long forgotten, if you like, those old habits will start to creep back in. But I was saying to someone the other day, like, what's kind of happened, and I love an analogy, by the way, but what's kind of happened is a bit like when somebody has a health scare, right? You know, they've been kind of probably a little bit overweight, maybe drinking too much, not kind of doing any exercise. You've been talking to my doctor. (laughs) (laughs) they perhaps have a health scare and then suddenly it gives them that kind of momentum that compelling reason if you like to actually do something about it and I think you know businesses have had this you know they've known for ages I need to innovate more I mean that's we talk to customers all the time yeah innovation is a kind of a top line agenda and we absolutely need to innovate but they perhaps haven't been kind of put it as much priority as they should have on it previously but now they've had this kind of big health shock if you like um and it has forced them to innovate because it's kind of like innovate or die really for some of some of these organizations recently so i think you know what in order to keep it going moving forwards it's really important to kind of reinforce like the good things that came out of this um, and by that I mean you, you know anything you can show around the fact that yes what we did was we you know we went to market with a whole new uh, you know business uh, line in a smaller amount of time and not an, a kind of example of that or a new we embraced a new operating model an example of that would be if you look at kind of the Lidl's and the Aldi's you know they very much have been around kind of low price supermarket shopping but they didn't have any delivery capability now clearly you know they've had to have that same delivery capability because we've seen you know Tesco's and Asda and Sainsbury's and everybody they can't feel you know fulfill the demand for it and it was great because what they've done is they've actually partnered with I think it's Deliveroo and they've actually said look you know you're delivering fast food how about delivering kind of supermarket food for us right and and you know they've now got an kind of an online delivery capability from that now why would you kind of do away with something that's just opened up a great a revenue stream so you know, I think I think just kind of making sure that everybody's mindful of what those innovations drove and from a kind of a top line and bottom line perspective as well. You know, we grew more revenue or actually we were able to actually trade in some cases. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, I think it is kind of say re- reinforcing that um, and not letting those old, old habits kind of creep back in. Because yeah. this is a really good time now to kind of, you know, stay kind of like you know be fit if you like for the future um rather than actually creep back to those old ways of working well absolutely i think one of the really interesting things one of the real positives is that everyone seems to have surprised themselves at the speed they could innovate the speed they could change you know i think people have been putting these things off because they felt it was going to be difficult and it was going to be painful and maybe these projects wouldn't succeed and actually under duress these massive transformations have been made. And, you know, yeah. per your, uh, per the, 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 the new research, you know, 92% of executives were kind of surprised at the speed that they, that they made this transition. I, I'd hope that gives them some confidence they can keep it going. Yeah, and again, I think it, it's, you know, beforehand, if you think about kind of rolling out a new technology, there's like lots of planning going on into it and um, often kind of you know taking it to many different steering committee type things um, and there's a lot of I don't know the momentum the, the, the necessity um, kind of perhaps isn't there to sort of drive them forwards and it's not saying that people have kind of cut corners but I think they've maybe taken a bit more of a pragmatic 
and a measured approach to risk actually so, <laughs> so you know if, if you think about it i mean i was chatting to an engineering company not so long ago that said our team's rollout was scheduled for 18 months across you know across the globe we did it in 18 days right and that's because if we didn't we wouldn't have been able to kind of actually work with our colleagues globally and we need to and um, i actually heard somebody the other day which was an engineering company that trumped that completely they said you know we literally did it in a few days right and it was a case of okay you know that measured risk taking what's the risk of me not having it versus the risk of me having a you know a tried and tested best of breed solution at the end of the day right um uh, rolled out so you know i think it shows you what you can do um when the when the need is there and i think it's you know we need to make sure we don't lose that sort of agility and we don't lose that sort of pragmatism as well and as i said if you if you're going with you know good best of breed technology providers like like ourselves right you know we we invest heavily into security because you know we need to make sure that our clients data is kept really really safe right so you know you're kind of, we're kind of taking some of that that risk if you like away from you really and some of those kind of concerns away from you um and then you know having a focus on and sometimes it just been good enough. So that's the other thing. People often focus, I think, on, on perfect. And, you know, we all know if you've embraced kind of agile ways of working, look at, you know, is it better than what I've got now? Is it an incremental improvement? What is just good enough for that first rollout? And then we can spend our time incrementally kind of adding to it and making it better and better. So, you know, I think people have had to embrace that way. Um, and I yeah, I do hope that they continue to do so. And again, it comes back to what I said earlier, you need to kind of remind people next time, you know, when this is all sort of over and done with, um, and you're looking at, you know, what you need to plan in your kind of, um, you know, your, your, your backlog of work, if you like, um, you know, be a little bit more open minded about what you can deliver. Um, do you and it, Do you think it'll change people's attitude to risk? Like the fact that they've that they've had to innovate and they, I think a lot of organizations recognize that they need to continue to innovate. You know, the, the, the picture right now for uh, the, so the next 12 months is, you know, ch very challenging in some sectors, mm -hmm. clearly a very different market going forward to what we experienced up to that, uh, that sort of disruption point of COVID hitting. Do you think that there's a different attitude to, to risk uh, appearing amongst particularly the sort of executive class now to yeah. say actually I will stake my name on making this project work. Yeah so I, I think in this kind of two sort of views on that really in a way so I think in terms of uh, looking at risk actually some of the areas of their business has been perhaps more broadly affected and exposed more of a risk actually in their business operations. Um, so if I just start with that, what I mean is if you look at things like the supply chain, right? So there's been a huge drive over the years to move to a very much a just in time type supply chain model, which is great when everything is working <laughs> really well and you don't have a global pandemic going on. But what it has done um, is it's exposed a lot of weakness in that supply chain. And so I think, you know, businesses are now having to look at, okay, how do I still have the efficiencies in, you know, just in time, if you like, from a sense of I'm not holding lots of inventory, I'm not tying up a lot of my cost, but I'm reducing the exposure to things like, um, you know, another pandemic and borders being shut. So do I start to look at a more of a multi-vendor supply chain type approach? And, you know, another example of that, I think, is in the kind of uh, outsourcing market. So, again, if you look at uh, particularly financial uh, services institutes, uh, financial services companies, sorry, and you also look at kind of utility companies, there was a big, big drive um, to use kind of outsourced uh, contact centres. And um, again, if you put it all in kind of one location, then there was a, you know, potentially a big challenge there. And I know, you know, certainly during, you know, some of the months in, in the pandemic, 
some of the contexts and some of the smaller ones in some of the locations like South America and India have been massively impacted, right? Because they kind of, they didn't have quite the same infrastructure to enable people to kind of work from home um, quite as easily. So, you know, some of the challenge again, when you're looking at the kind of the workforce is like the supply chain, how can you de-risk that from a kind of a multi-region um, perspective? And how can you build a bit more choice um, and cope with those variabilities, if you like, both from a kind of workforce perspective, but a supply chain perspective. So that's where I think it's opened up how, you know, it's opened up organisations' eyes to the fact that there is a lot of risk around their operations that perhaps um, they, they weren't, hadn't planned quite as well for. There's, there's a really nice illustrations of the shift from being concerned about the risk of innovating to being concerned about the risk of not innovating. Like actually the, there's, this, there's a load of risk already and um, which we're exposed to if we don't change things rather than being overly focused on the risk of what we do. It's, it's the risk of what we don't do. And I think those things are yeah. so often hidden. And, 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 and it, it, as you say, yeah, we've been going to organisations for years and saying, you know, innovate, innovate, innovate. And they say, I know we need to. But it's really exposed that, hasn't it? Yeah. I, I thought one of the things that was really interesting that came out of the, the survey results was the really different attitude to this sort of continuing innovation between employees and executives where actually a lot of execs were kind of happy with the way things were before and I, I think half it is say I want to go back to the way things were before yeah. and whereas you know 83% of employees yeah prefer the what we prefer the situation we've moved to prefer these new ways of working do you, yeah. do you think do you think that mindset is is likely to be overcome do you think that's going to see certain people you know perhaps less suited to new ways of working what, what's going to what's going to shift yeah. that intransigent half of executives do you think yeah so i i found that stat really interesting as well and i thought well maybe it's a kind of it's a fear thing right so um if you're kind of you know an exec you've obviously got generally a lot of experience you're used to things being done in a certain way and this has come and kind of disrupted things so you know the fact that kind of 50 uh, almost 50 percent of execs are kind of saying that you know they kind of like to go back to previous ways of working I think a lot of that is definitely rooted in fear um, and it's the unknown right so we're asking a lot of people to step into the um, to the unknown and then I think to myself again you know what's that you know how can we get over that and it's got to be backed up by data right it's got to be backed up by kind of data points and we need to start thinking much more about the kind of the output and the value rather than the productivity side of things i.e somebody can be really busy <laughs> but you know we've all met people in life i'm sure that are brilliant at being busy but, you know, what are they actually delivering? And I think, you know, for execs to really feel comfortable about this way of working, you need to have a way that you can measure the value that people are contributing to the organisation rather than just the kind of just the sort of velocity or the pure productivity type metrics. Um, and I think, you know, I'm a big fan, actually, of um, OKR, so objectives and key results, as a way of kind of getting everybody um, sort of centred around what you're trying to do as a business, giving them the autonomy to work in a way that, um, you know, drives value against those key objectives for the business. And they're completely outcome driven, um, as opposed to I've done, you know, 50 hours of training this month so therefore I've ticked my L&D type um, objective or you know I've answered you know this amount of emails or this amount of uh, phone calls and indeed you know we're seeing that in kind of service desks actually you know service desks now obviously with tools like service now you're automating um, a lot of work away from agents so you know when you're measuring people you can't measure how many calls they're necessarily um, uh, you know responding to what you want to be measuring is the value of that customer interaction so uh, I think yeah value driven metrics um, really focused on the outcome is the is a way to help those execs in overcoming that fear that's a, I think that's a really interesting target for innovation I think you know an area we could talk about some more but you know what do you see other sort of really obvious um, targets for innovation investment right now that have maybe been thrown up by the crisis. 
you know, particularly around, you know, where would you be, if you, if you were in that executive's role now, the one who's actually bought into the fact that we need to maintain this momentum of innovating, you know, where would you be sinking your, your attention and your investment right now? Um, I, I, I think, again, it do, will depend on the industry that you're, you're in. So, um, for example, you know, if you are in uh, healthcare, if you're in retail, if you're in hospitality, right, um, clearly that physical kind of interaction um, is, is very minimised. So you need to be looking at how you can still deliver those services. You can still, in the case of a revenue um, a retail industry, you can still, you know, keep and protect your revenue base. So I would be looking at, okay, you know, what, what do we do? Or oh, we sell stuff. Okay, if we don't have a good online presence, then we need to be, you know, rapidly, um, you know, rapidly investing in that. And the same with um, healthcare and hospitality is a, a little bit trickier because obviously, you know, because of certain restrictions, it means that people can't do it potentially be there in person. But again, you know, what can you do? Um, how can you, if you like, pivot your operating model to be more digital? I suppose that's what it comes down to is like, you know, you understand what your business model is and how you make money, but how can you invest in innovations in your, in your operating model, which will actually drive that business? And, and it is going to vary totally, as I said, from industry to industry. But, you know, digital is not going away. So, you know, digital transformation, um, which we've been talking about for some time, is clearly, you know, back firmly on the agenda and getting, you know, the focus it actually probably needed some time ago. Brilliant. Thanks very much, guys. I think we'll stop there. But that was a really compelling conversation. And I hope our listeners agree. Um, thank you very much.